Valuing electronic music uh, is an innovative research project using qualitative and quantitative methods to study the role of online and offline interactions in producing the cultural value of electronic music. I'll explain exactly what we mean by that later. It's also an attempt to study the London electronic music scene in all of its diversity. And it's funded by a six-month grant from the HRC and the Cultural Value Project, uh, although we're hoping to continue the research for a much longer period than the six months that we're actually funded for. This project began um, with an idea... Well, it be, it, this project began partly with the research that I was talking about with um, visual art producers in the east of London. Um, uh, but it also, on a theoretical level, it began with an idea drawn from the work of the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, uh, which is that specifically cultural value, as opposed to economic value or um, anything like that, consists in nothing more nor less than cultural producers' evaluations of one another's work. Um, Bourdieu focused on the contrast between uh, what socio sociologists call legitimate culture which essentially means uh, largely non-commercial non culture which is celebrated through the educational system. So things like classical music, um, serious literature, fine art, etc. So the contrast between that and mainstream middle-brow and low-brow commercial culture, things like popular fiction, Hollywood movies, etc. Um, since Bourdieu, um, sociologists of culture have, have taken that further by um, studying other non-commercial forms of culture in ways sort of drawing on Bourdieu's study of what he called the field of restricted production, which is this uh, legitimate culture. For example, there have been some interesting studies of um, hip-hop, uh, jazz. Uh, I've done some work on um, a largely forgotten art form called interactive fiction, um, looking at the way that these fields are sustained by uh, production for producers. So these are people producing not in order to sell to a large audience, because that generally doesn't exist, but people producing for the appreciation of other people whose work they appreciate. And you can see that going on in all sorts of, of cultural areas. So a lot of what I've been concerned with theoretically is on the one hand how methodologies that allow you to deal with musical situations wherein people are engaging with one another in the microdynamics of making music together and on the other hand the fact that those mutually intimately oriented musical interactions are in many cases simultaneously being broadcast or published out to an audience of unknown persons. Um, so the, the terms I've used to describe this multiple or, uh, or simultaneous kinds of social orientation, talk about intimacies and talk about imaginaries. So intimacies being those kinds of face-to-face -face interactions, um, imaginaries being those kinds of interactions that address dear listeners, dear readers, these kinds of relationships that are equally social relationships, but involve a, a different kind of orientation. I'll bracket for now um, some of the theory that's been written up on intimate publics because there's a, a, a body of literature on that, but just to have this productive, I think, I hope, opposition in place. One of the, one of the areas that immediately complicates the opposition is this thing in the middle here that I've called public spaces. The fact that there are venues and that venues advertise or even broadcast out to publics. Um, but the fact that public spaces are places where people can meet and interact face to face, even if it's only to spill somebody else's beer. So there's, there's that sense of a public space being a potential place for fledgling intimacies or where you go with intimates where intimate interactions, musical interactions are taking place, calibrated very closely to one another in time. So I've been so this is the the broad area of interest that 
I've been investigating for the most part, as I said before, in the realm of North American indigenous music. And I've been investigating this kind of relationship for the most part in the offline world. I've been thinking about musicians making music together face to face. I've been thinking about acts of performance and publication largely through the radio, through traditional uh, recorded media, through print publication. But again, with, um, with online forms of interaction, you have this place in the middle that I think is a particularly interesting, fascinating place where it's possible on the one hand to cultivate intimacies to people that you get to know. And on the other hand, it's possible to publish to a, a, a world of strangers. Um, and so it's those online equivalents of public spaces that I'm, I, I also think are particularly fascinating places. Um, and SoundCloud is one of those, where you actually you can, you can end up cultivating relationships, developing intimacies with people. So if you like, uh, I'm interested in this project, particularly in, in the kind of two zones or two kinds of orientation and, and the zones that enable both of them um, and investigating those. And it seems to me that electronic music production involves all of them. Um, and so the, the trick is coming to terms with methodologically with methods that are robust and open to investigating all of these venues of so all, all of these kinds of social orientation and all of these venues for social interaction. Um, and so methodologically what our fix has been has been to incorporate on the one hand um, uh, broad studies of data from the SoundCloud website, largely quantitative, and then um, interviews uh, with particular persons and to interview people about their acts of publication and performance, whether those are in uh, offline venues or online ones, um, to ask them about their relationships, the kinds of relationships that they cultivate with persons. Um, so that that grounds us in terms of what kinds of social networks we're looking at. We're looking at the relationships that people cultivate online and offline with publics of strangers, but we're also interested in the kinds of relationships they cultivate with known and knowable persons, and specifically we're interested in looking at the ways that valuing is at the center of all of those relationships. This section of the day is going to be about the methodology we're using for the project. So we're using a combination of uh, qualitative and quantitative research. So I'm going to first of all talk a little bit about the, um, the nuts and bolts in terms of collecting the data, the quantitative side of things. Um, so we are using SoundCloud, as I mentioned before. SoundCloud is the um, social media site for musicians. And there is a large amount of data that we can collect that is freely available, freely made available by SoundCloud through the, their API, which is their um, point at which you can request information from their site and they'll down, send you the data. Um, there's the little link down the bottom there. So you can collect all sorts of information. You can collect information about users and it's not just a case of what's the user's name, where do they come from, it's things like how many followers do they have, how many tracks have they favorited, um, how many um, tracks have they clicked, I like this. Um, you can collect um, information about where their avatars are if you were interested in that kind of thing. There's all sorts of connections, connections to MySpace if they have that, connections to sites that I've never even heard of, Discogs. Um, no one seems to have recorded any data for that, so that might be uh, slightly irrelevant. Just don't make any records. <laughs> so, and beyond the users, you can collect information on the tracks that the users have created and uploaded to SoundCloud. So, as well as things like, here is the track, uh, it is available at this URL, 
You can collect information like the beats per minute of the track. You can collect information like the tags that we mentioned earlier. They can put multiple tags to say this is... And there's no um, problem with randomness that there are just lots of people on there who don't really do anything. Yeah, you've preempted this slide, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so one way to discard data from our sample is to remove those users who aren't really contributing to the network, who aren't really participating. So, see my little red circle there? That's a user who follows other users, but no one's following them. So, we would say, this person is not so influential, so we can remove them for the moment. Whereas over here, we have um, the Justin Timberlake node, I do believe who um, has lots of followers, but does nothing on the SoundCloud network. So we're not so interested in what Justin Timberlake is doing. Uh, we're interested in these guys here who are participating <coughs> by following other people or liking other people's tracks or are participating in some other way, but are also having that same interaction coming back to them. So there's uh, activity both ways. So, just because we like these little diagrams, the top little circle was the horrific mess of users that we had. In, this is 500 users, um, and around the circle, you have all the users, and this is all the connections between them. So, if you take away all the people who... Oh, I forget which way around it is. So, just be, so a connection <laughs> would be defined as someone commenting on a track or liking that, something that the person produced, yeah. or... Yeah. Them. yeah, interacting with them in some way, yeah. yeah. So once we remove both the people who are not participating by following others, Justin Timberlake, and the people who are not having interactions coming into them, it's still a mess, but there's slightly more structure there. So the idea is that we can condense slightly. Um, I'll stop talking there except just to point towards uh, what we're doing with this. We're using various methods of analysis, firstly to find the most influential users, um, which gives us an idea of the top guys, the most influential guys, various methods. Um, but then we want to really know a little bit more about what's going on in the network beyond the top guys. And I hear we're feeding back and forth between what Byron and Daniel are finding out from interviewing people as well. We're also looking at how little networks within the network arise and what we can find out from those. Um, but I've put the etc there because I'm hoping to get some feedback as well about what else we could do with this data now we have it. Um, I'm going to pass over to the others. Uh, we'll have a discussion period to talk about the decisions that I've just talked about and what Byron and Daniel will present. And there are four or five points to make here. And the, the first uh, comes out of the participant observer kinds of engagement, and that's that valuing takes verbal and nonverbal forms. Um, and so we do find that people are leaving comments, following people, these sorts of things. But what about when you go out to a show? How do people appreciate electronic music? depends on the genre, of course. Uh, the gig I was at yesterday, um, uh, I'm sure that uh, appreciation was shown in part by remaining silent during the performance. And when a couple of people behind me started talking during it, so I was wondering about the effect on the musicians who are up on stage. It was a, it was a, very, it was a very quiet performance. Uh, when I spoke to a DJ who works at not entirely mainstream, but still it's a pretty mainstream gig playing at, um, at a bar in Shoreditch High Street, he said, well, I know people are into what I'm playing when they jump up and down, when they scream, when they yell, you know, uh, that's the tune. You'll, actually, I'm quoting directly from a, a bit of an interview transcript that you'll see later. And then 
On the other hand, when Daniel and I went out to see a grime event, it was very interesting to, to me to see the, the very specific ways that, it seemed to me at least, on, on a first night out at this event, and I need to go back, possibly talk to people to see if my, my intuitions are, are correct, the ways that people seem to be performing their appreciation for what was going on. At this event, there were people dancing, definitely, but they weren't dancing facing each other, or the major uh, a lot of people were not dancing facing each other. They were dancing looking at the DJ booth. And it's not like the DJs were doing anything particularly exciting. Every once in a while, they'd pump their fist in the air, or they'd do a rewind, or something, something interesting would happen. But generally speaking, they were kind of manning the decks and, and occupying themselves with the, uh, with the basic logistics of, of running the evening. Um, so why were people not facing one another, facing the DJ booth? Uh, it seemed to me that what they were doing in part was performing a kind of engagement, letting the DJ know that they were into what the DJ was playing. So they were moving around, but they were moving around while facing the DJ booth. as a way of, if you like, um, communicating one's openness to the music, one's appreciation of the music, and there's a particular embodied way of doing that. Whereas at other clubs, it might be very well that you don't orient yourself at all towards the DJ booth, that you just go out and have a good time. That's how the DJ knows that they're being successful. Right. So what this is suggesting is that um, First of all, there are, there are nonverbal ways of communicating appreciation. And secondly, that these two are specific to genre. That people have genre ways of performing their liking for their appreciation of certain types of music. There are more and less appropriate ways to behave in certain contexts. Um, and that you respond to music in particular ways. So that's a uh, a little bit that comes out of some of the ethnographic data. The second point is that value involves valuables, um, that there are things that people want. Um, so one of the things that uh, I think came up even on, on, on Daniel's um, uh, examples of, of materials that, that, or comments that were listed on SoundCloud were things like download, question mark, DL, question mark, in other words, could I get this for free, please? Well, the fact that people are asking for it means that there's something that they want. And there are complicated relationships to music. Um, uh, I spoke to one DJ and asked, you know, so uh, do you buy your own music? I said, no, <laughs> none of it. Download it all for free. Right. Um, but he argued to me that he did value the music that he played and that he showed his valuing for it by playing it for other people. Third, um, talk about value often becomes talk about relationships. When I ask people to talk about instances when they've known themselves to be valued or when they valued other people, they start talking about pretty generally speaking, close relationships with other producers that have, that have, uh, that have come about. So I, inter I interviewed, for instance, uh, a woman who has about 9,000 followers on Mixcloud, uh, which is a, another uh, music, uh, social, social music networking site. Um, and one of the things that she's active in doing is she finds music producers whose music she really likes, and uh, she'll fold their music into her mixes. Sometimes she'll get in touch with them, contact them, and on occasion she'll also go out of her way to start promoting them. So she'll arrange for, she'll, I think in a, in a couple of cases, she even arranged for interviews with newspapers with particular producers all of this for free. 
she told me that she was thinking of eventually moving into the, the business of management. This was good practice for it. The fact of the matter was she was, the people she valued was the things that, were, were the people that she was willing to do things for, for free for. Um, there was that kind of personal relationship. When we interviewed another producer, or a, or a producer more specifically, he said that um, the, the way that uh, valuing was most evident amongst peers, people who were kind of on the same level as one another, was that they would, they would collaborate. They'd work together on a particular track and release it jointly on both of their uh, SoundCloud pages. So there's a sense that valuing meant closer and closer forms of engagement, that somehow investing in music was investing, in other, investing time in other people. Um, this, this was the third thing that emerged so far from the data. And the things that I've just been talking about, the examples I've just been using, are also examples of this fourth point, that the valuing of electronic music involves participants in very complicated forms of economics, uh, econo economies of patronage, I've called them here, um, and they're not necessarily market economies. They're economies, uh, they're reciprocal economies that involve investment of time and, uh, and effort in people that one knows. And that uh, when, when we talk to people, it seems that these kinds of valuing are the ones that emerge most when, uh, when discussions of the, of the deep dynamics of the sociality of, of, of uh, SoundCloud even, uh, but, but other things too emerge. Uh, I can add a fi final point that uh, came up over lunch. Uh, a, a fifth and final point is that interesting kinds of fabrications and misrepresentations seem to be possible online in the same way as they are in, in public spaces in the offline world. That there, there are clever ways to make use of systems to misrepresent yourself. Uh, when I talk to um, the Mixcloud uh, um, DJ, who is also a manager, she talked about the ability to buy likes on Facebook. You can buy a bunch of likes for your like page um, and, uh, and, and by that means sort of get a little bit more recognition for yourself as a musician. Um, the, the kinds of, uh, and what she argued was it's much more important actually to have relationships with real people rather than bot likes. The likes that you work hard for, that you go out of your way to make, um, as personally, are the one, those are the people who are going to talk about you with their friends. Those are the people that you are going to matter to, and they'll, they'll work for you in a way that bot likes simply won't. Um, so um, again, uh, to uh, a fifth and final point is that there are fascinating ways of fabricating, um, fabricating sociality um, that are in themselves, of course, deeply social, um, that, are, that are worth investigating. And, and, and it suggests a nice point of similarity between, say, the offline street and the online street as public spaces where you can be sort of tricked into various kinds of uh, fabrications uh, by, by, by various agents. When I think about what we might be contributing in a kind of activist sense, it's a sense that we want to complicate the idea of what, what value is thought to be. Yeah. Um, that we want to think about, uh, about insisting that there are many kinds of economies, mm -hmm. <laughs> there are many kinds of valuings, um, and, and that they need to be taken seriously because here we've got evidence of people, you know, really seriously valuing things with lots and lots of time spent doing it um, in creating economies that are not 
primarily uh, based around the circulation of capital, although that's part of it. <laughs> it's part of it, and in, in complicated ways. So insisting on the, on the complexity of the of, of of the modes of valuing that people are involved in and supporting all the time. I mean, for me, one of the most important one of my most important motiva motivations for doing this is actually essentially is critiquing the the idea of cultural value itself, um, because the if you can show that cultural value actually reduces to acts of valuing on the part of particular networks of people, then that removes the idea that there is, it makes it impossible to, to have an idea of absolute cultural value or, um, and it would make it difficult to, uh, you know, justify particular funding choices on the basis of the supposedly objective uh, properties of, of particular works because it reveals that in fact those have their value because they were, because of the act of valuing carried out by people in different networks. So. For, for me, that's an important part of this project, he says to the person on the cultural value <laughs> panel.